All right, welcome back to another episode of Science with Serbeck. In today's episode, what we're going to be talking about is the types of chemical reactions and a couple of objectives that I want you to be able to meet by the end of this video is to be able to uh, describe each type of reaction and given products, uh, or excuse me, given reactants, uh, be able to predict products from the different types of reactions. So we've gone over and we've balanced a lot of equations so far. So what this means is that there is a lot of different types of reactions out there. So it's really important to classify these reactions into their separate categories. So we start out here with classifying chemical reactions. And chemists classify reactions in order to organize the many different types of reactions. So if we organize and classify chemical reactions into their own categories, it's going to help remember uh, and understand more about each and every chemical reaction. So what we do in this class is we classify chemical reactions into five different categories. The first category is called a synthesis reaction. The second category is known as a combustion reaction. The third category is known as a decomposition reaction. The fourth category is known as a single replacement reaction. And the final category that we'll look at in this class is known as a double replacement reaction. So what we're going to do with the rest of these notes is we're going to take a look at each and every one of these categories. We're going to define it and then be able to balance some chemical equations. So we start out here with the first category, which is known as a synthesis reaction. And so a synthesis reaction is just defined as a reaction in which two or more substances react to produce a single product. Now to help remember this, what we have is a generalized formula for a synthesis reaction. And that generalized formula is the, again, generic compound or element B reacting with generic compound or element uh, B, A and B react together to produce a compound that is one of both of those combined. Now to help understand a little bit more, we have uh, some additional examples here of a synthesis reaction. So one of these examples is where we have two, two elements form one compound. So an example here is solid iron reacting with chlorine gas to form iron three chloride. So again, two elements become one compound. And then we also, we also have instances where two compounds can form one compound. So let's take, for example, a calcium oxide. Calcium oxide has the formula of CaO plus our water, H2O, and when they react together, they form a compound known as calcium hydroxide. So again, the big format here is we had two things condensed down to one. So two or more substances condensed down to one particular product. Now, a combustion reaction, on the other hand, is just defined as a reaction in which oxygen keyword oxygen combines with a substance and releases energy in the form of heat and light. Now you can have combustion reactions that only produce water or you could have combustion reactions that only produce carbon dioxide. And so if you have those two things, uh, what's happening is it's combining with oxygen. So by definition, you can call it a combustion reaction and it also could be classified as a th synthesis reaction. Now I'm not going to get into the details of that because what we're interested really 
with a combustion reaction is when a hydrocarbon is burned in the presence of oxygen. It's a special type of combustion reaction and this is a hydrocarbon burned in the presence of oxygen. They're gonna have two products form if you have a hydrocarbon burned in the presence of oxygen. So when a hydrocarbon burns in the presence of oxygen, one of those two products that is always produced is carbon dioxide. And that is a gaseous form of carbon dioxide. That's why we have the G in parentheses. The other product that forms is water, H2O, and this is water vapor. So let's go ahead, let's put uh, the knowledge that we just learned about a synthesis and combustion reaction together and let's balance some chemical equations here. So we'll, we'll transition pages here and we'll balance some synthesis and combustion reaction examples. So over here, we have sodium and oxygen reacting together. So when sodium and oxygen uh, combine together, again, they synthesize, and we could also classify this as a combustion reaction because sodium is burning in the presence of oxygen. What happens here is we get a combination of sodium and oxygen. Now, sodium, when it combines with oxygen, is going to have a one plus charge. Oxygen, when it combines with sodium, has a O2 minus. So again, we swoop the charge number to form our subscript. And so that means we get a product of Na, two O. Now we have to balance this particular equation. So we have one Na on the left and on the right we have two Na's. So we have to put a coefficient of two out in front. Now on the left for our oxygens we have two uh, O's on the left and on the right we have one O. So to make this two O's, we have to put a two out in front. Now look what that has done to our sodiums. So what this means is we no longer have two, we have two times two, and so we need four. So again, it's always important to balance in pencil, and so if we make a mistake like that, we uh, can uh, go back and um, fix our mistake. Now, we have this, we have uh, benzene, which is a hydrocarbon. Notice it has carbon and hydrogen, that makes it a hydrocarbon. It's burned in the presence of oxygen. And so if you need to think to yourself, well, what happens here? Well, this is what happens. We only have CO2 as a gas and water vapor, H2O, also as a gas form. When you have a hydrocarbon, carbon and hydrogen burn in the presence of oxygen, the only two products are CO2 and H2O. So we'll go through and we'll balance this. On the left we have six carbons. On the right we only have one, so we need to put a coefficient of six. We have six H's on the left, on the right, we need to get to six H's. So to do that, we put a three out in front. So that makes three times two. And then we go through our oxygens. So our oxygens on our left, we have two. On our right, we have six times two, which is 12, plus three times one. 12 plus three is 15. Now, if we're thinking to ourselves, and this is often the case with a combustion reaction involving a hydrocarbon, a whole number times two will never get us to 15. So if this is our problem, like we have here, what we're gonna do, we're gonna cover up O2 oxygen, and right now we are going to double, we are going to double all other coefficients. So this was a coefficient of one, it becomes a coefficient of two, 
This was a coefficient of six. If we double it, it becomes a coefficient of 12. And then over here, if we double three, it becomes a coefficient of six. Now we can go back to our oxygens, O2. So now we have 12 times two, that's 24 oxygens. And then we have six times one. So we have 24 plus six, that's a total of 30. We have to think to ourselves, what times two would get us 30? Well, 15 times two would get us 30. Now you can go back and, and check and make sure everything is balanced, it is, uh, to, to make sure we have our balanced chemical equation. But with combustion reactions of hydrocarbons, you're gonna get a very large mm -hmm. coefficient, and that is uh, pretty uh, typical. All right, so now we have a word equation down here. We have a solid aluminum uh, and sulfur react to produce aluminum sulfide. So this is really nice. Aluminum, remember, has the symbol of Al. It reacts with sulfur, which is just S, and it produces aluminum sulfide. Now, aluminum sulfide is a compound. So remember, we have Al, which if you need to look on that ion formula chart, totally fine, but Al has a charge of three plus. Sulfide is an element. It has the element symbol of S, Remember sulfide, you took off the ending and you, that came from sulfur. And sulfur has a charge of two minus. Again, both of those charges you can look up on that ion formula chart. So remember, to form this particular product here, we crisscross the charges to become the subscripts. And so aluminum sulfide, the formula for aluminum sulfide becomes Al2 s3 all right so now we need to balance it so we have one al on the left we have two al's on the right we just go ahead and we put a two coefficient we have one one uh, s on the left three on the right we go ahead and put a three out in front and we are balanced all right, so we've had some practice with synthesis and combustion reactions. And now we can move to our third type of reaction, which is a decomposition reaction. So a decomposition reaction. Uh, what a decomposition reaction is defined as is a reaction in which a single compound breaks down into two or more elements or two or more uh, compounds. Now, decomposition reactions often require energy source, uh, such as heat, light, or electricity to occur. Now, to help remember a decomposition reaction, they also have a generalized formula. And that generalized formula is, again, a generic compound we call AB breaks down into its elements A plus B. So we now have uh, this example down here. Aluminum oxide decomposes when electricity is passed through it. So aluminum oxide, uh, we start out with the symbol of Al. If you need to look up the, the charge of aluminum, you can on the ion formula sheet, but it is a charge of three plus. Oxide is the element for oxygen or O. And if you look up the charge for oxygen, it is O2 minus. We crisscross our charge numbers to become our uh, subscripts. And so what the formula for aluminum oxide is Al2O3. Now it breaks down into its individual element. So when uh, these compound here, aluminum oxide breaks down, breaks down to aluminum. Now we always got to check, is aluminum one of our seven diatomic elements? Well, the answer is, is no. So we can leave it by itself. 
Now, oxygen, it is one of those diatomic elements. And so we can't just have O. Whenever we have oxygen by itself, it has to be O2. So now we can balance it. So on the left, we have two Al's. On the right, we only have one. So we got to put a two coefficient right here. We now have three oxygens. And over here on the right, we have two oxygens. So we have a problem here. Now, whenever you have the, the three, two combo, you're trying to balance out what we try to get to is six of each atom. So I'm gonna try to get to six oxygens on the left. So I need to multiply out in front here by two. And then over here, what times two could get us six? Well, that's three. Now, we now affect our aluminums. It's no longer just two, it's two times two. So this means we have a total of four aluminums. To balance this out, we have to have four aluminums. All right, so another um, another example here, we have nickel two hydroxide uh, decomposes to produce nickel two oxide in water. So nickel two, first off the symbol for nickel is Ni, and remember, it's a transition metal, so that charge is indicated in Roman numerals, that's a, a Roman numeral two for two plus hydroxide you can look on your ion formula sheet but i'm going to give it to you hydroxide has the formula of oh with a one minus charge we crisscross the charge numbers to become the subscript so nickel two hydroxide has the formula of ni and now because we need two ohs we put it in parentheses so it breaks down into nickel two oxide, which again, nickel two, uh, it's just like we had before, Ni with a two plus charge. Oxide has an O two minus charge. Now notice here, two and two, the subscripts would both be two and two. So that means nickel two oxide would just be NiO. And, it produces water, so H2O. Now we look close here and we have to make sure that we're balanced. Ni on the left, we have one. Ni on the right, we have one as well. Oxygens, total, two times one, so we have two oxygens on the left. On the right, we have to be careful here. We have oxygen from our NiO and another oxygen from our H2O. So that produces two oxygens. And then we have two hydrogens because on the left, two hydrogens, we have to multiply what's outside parentheses by the inside. And then over here on the right, we have two hydrogens. So right here, this problem is balanced. Okay, so we can move on to our fourth type of reaction. And that type of reaction is a single replacement reaction. So we'll switch gears here and we'll transition to a single replacement reaction. Now, a single replacement reaction is just defined as a reaction in which the atoms of one element replace the atoms of a, another element in a compound. Now, in a single replacement reaction, it also has a generalized formula that we can use help uh, help use as a guide. So in this generalized formula, again, we have generic element A, uh, and it reacts with this compound we'll call BX. And then in the replacement reaction, what happens is that A bumps out B, and this new compound becomes AX, and B gets bumped out all by itself again. Now, one thing that we have to consider with a single replacement reaction is not everything will react if we have a single replacement rea reaction. So what we need to consider are chemical reactivities. And uh, again, a metal will not always replace um, a metal in a compound dissolved in water, 
because of differing reactivities. And now this, this rule of replacements or this activity series that we're about ready to talk about only applies to single replacement reactions. And so what we do to help rank chemical reactivities is we use an uh, activity series. And so this activity series that we use uh, looks like this. And the activity series for metals places the most active metal at the top and the least active at the bottom. So again, the most active elements are at the top. Now, the least active element is listed at the bottom. And so how we use this particular list is this. If, if the single element, the single element all by itself, is above the element it's trying to replace, the reaction can happen. So again, the single element has to be above that other metal or element it's trying to replace for the uh, single replacement reaction to happen. And we're, we're gonna use this chart, we're gonna use this as a guide, but I first wanna outline the steps for how we can find or how we can predict a single replacement reaction. So we'll go over the steps right here. So the first step to replace or predict if a single replacement reaction will happen is to separate elements into their individual ions. The next thing here is to determine what two elements will replace each other. Then what we need to do is we need to use the activity series to see if that uh, reaction will even occur. And so a general rule of thumb here, the more active element has to replace the less active element. So the best way to see this is through a example or a set of examples. So magnesium and aluminum chloride in our first example here react together and we wanna see first can this reaction occur? So the first thing that we need to identify is what is trying to replace what? Well, magnesium is a metal, and over here, these two things, the only thing that is a metal is aluminum. So I'm gonna draw an arrow here. Magnesium is trying to bump out aluminum. Now, the only way for this to happen is that element by itself, in this case magnesium, needs to be higher on that list than aluminum. So again, magnesium needs to be higher on the list than aluminum. So we look at our list here, and we find magnesium. Don't, don't confuse it with manganese, it's magnesium. Magnesium, because it is trying to replace aluminum, has to be higher on it or more active than aluminum. So we find aluminum, it's right underneath it. This magnesium is higher on the list or is more active, so the reaction can happen. So what happens here is this. Magnesium can bump out aluminum, and what forms is magnesium chloride. Now out here, Mg has a two plus charge. When it combines with Cl, it has a one minus charge. We crisscross the charge number. So we have or identify the subscript. So this becomes MgCl2. And then aluminum gets bumped out by magnesium and it becomes all by itself. So aluminum all by itself is just Al. Now we need to balance it. So what we have right now, magnesium, we have one on the left, one on the right, we're good right now. Aluminum, we have one on the left, one on the right, almost there. And then we have three chlorines and three, or excuse me, two on the right. So remember our three, two combo, we always try to match up at six. So to get to six chlorines here on the left, we put a coefficient of two 
To get to six chlorines on the right, we put a coefficient of three. And now we've messed up our aluminum and our magnesium count. So right now we have three times one magnesium. That means we need a three coefficient. We have two times one, two aluminums on the left. We need a coefficient of two in front of uh, aluminum. Okay, so right there, that's balance, and we can go from here. So now we have bromine and magnesium chloride, the thing we just produced in this reaction above. So bromine, this guy right here, Br, is a nonmetal. So we look at our compound, we identify the nonmetal. It's always listed second on the it's always listed second on the ionic compound. So this case, bromine is trying to bump out chlorine. What we do is we look at our list. Again, we figured out step one, what is uh, bumping out what? And then we have to have bromine try to replace chlorine. So we find that it's down here. Bromine is located right here. It has to be above chlorine, and look there, chlorine is above bromine. What this means is that bromine is less active and cannot replace chlorine. So what has to happen, or what doesn't happen, is a reaction. We can put as much bromine and as much magnesium chloride in there as possible, because bromine is less active, it's lower on the list than chlorine, we have no reaction occur. And so when no reaction occurs, we just write NR. And just as a side note here, NR equals no reaction. All right, so uh, we've gotten two of the three, or excuse me, two of the three. How about four of the five types of the reaction? We have one more type of reaction to talk about here and then we'll be all set. So we'll transition to double replacement reactions. This is our last set here uh, for uh, this set of notes. So double replacement reactions. They are just defined as a reaction that occurs when ions exchange between two compounds. Now again, double replacement reactions have a generalized formula. And this generalized formula is compound we'll call AX, reacts with compound we'll call BY. And then when the, the, the formula or the reaction happens, AY combines together, and then we get BX to combine together. So essentially, they switched partners. They switched pairs in this particular type of reaction. So um, let's go through and let's try some examples down below. So this first example here, we have calcium hydroxide and phosphoric acid reacting together. So what we have to do first is we have to identify the ions. So what I do in these scenarios is I just divide my compounds in half. And again, if you're confused in this, you can go through the naming protocol. Okay, well, how did I get calcium hydroxide? How did I get phosphoric acid? And what's really helpful is that ion formula chart. So that's where we can turn to for some help. So now, our calcium, which is positive, is going to try to combine with phosphate. And now because it's a double replacement reaction, we don't have to check that activity series. Both of these things are exchanging those ions. So calcium and phosphate. Calcium, you can look, you can look calcium up, but mm -hmm. calcium has the formula, or excuse me, charge of CA, CA with a two plus charge. Now, phosphate has the formula PO4. It's a polyatomic ion. And it has the charge, you can look it up, of three minus. Again, we need to swap charge numbers in the formula for calcium phosphate becomes Ca3P2 
CaO4 2. Again, Ca3, PO4 is in parentheses, 2. Then the other item that is involved here is now our H, which is our H plus, combines with our OH. So H plus and OH minus, each of them with a 1 minus 1 plus. We crisscross and we form the formula HOH, okay? Now, if we combine this together, HOH is just water, H2O. So I'm gonna put H2O. And we're not quite done because we gotta balance our chemical equations. So I'm just gonna erase some marks so we're not confused uh, by that as we go through this balancing process. Okay, so to balance this particular equation, we look here at our calciums. So over here on the left, you have one calcium. Over here on the right, you have three calciums. So we gotta even that out. We put a three coefficient here on the left, and then we go to our um, oxygens. Now, remember what I've been saying is that, hey, if you have one chunk like PO4, PO4 is a chunk or a polyatomic ion that stays the same on the left and right, what happens here is uh, this we are not gonna count those oxygens. So the only oxygens, I wanna want you to pretend that PO4 is not there, the only oxygens are here. So we have two times one, two oxygens, but that whole thing gets multiplied by three. So really we have six oxygens. So we gotta make six oxygens here on the right, and we only have a subscript of, of one, so we write down a six. Now what we do, is we move on to our H's. Now our H's, we can't do what we did with the phosphates. But here we have two times one, so two, times three, so six H's, plus our three H's. So six plus three is nine. Right here we have six times two, so that's 12. Well, I want us to pause and think about H's for a second. I want to get back to it. Let's go to PO4s. Now remember I said PO4 is a whole chunk because it's a polyatomic ion. Look over here, and I know I wrote it small, but PO4 is a whole chunk. We have two of them. So now we got to make two PO4s. So all we do is put a two coefficient because we only had one of those chunks. So now, remember I said, hey, let's get back to the hydrogen. We had six on our right. Now we have two times three, that's six, plus two times one times three, which is six. So six plus six gets us a total of 12. So right here, this equation is balanced. Now we can move down. Our last example for these notes, we have aqueous lithium iodide, which lithium iodide, you have Li1 plus, I has a charge of one minus, so lithium iodide becomes L-I-I. -I. Lithium iodide, it reacts with silver nitrate. Silver, silver always have, has a charge of one plus. Nitrate has a formula of NO3 one minus. When they react together, they form AgNO3. That's how you would write out the formula. And then these things are going to swap partners here. So what happens? We have the ions, right? So our silver is going to combine with our iodine. So Ag is still a plus one charge. Iodine is still a one minus charge. Again, we, we flip flop the charges here. Silver iodide, when they become combined together, they form AgI. And then Li combines together with NO3. So Li, we already had that up here of Li1 plus and NO3 nitrate is NO3 one minus. Okay, again, they're one and one. So that means my formula for lithium nitrate becomes LiNO3. 
Now, before we get to balancing, I'm just gonna erase our marks here I used to help with our double replacement reaction, and we'll go from here. So, uh, lithiums. We have one lithium on the left, one on the right, they're balanced. Iodines, we have one on the left, we have one on the right. Silver, we have one on the left, one on the right. Nitrates, we have one on the left, one on the right. So right there, that is balancing our double replacement reaction between lithium iodide and silver nitrate. All right, so I, I hope you have learned a lot here about the different types of reaction in this episode of Science with Serbac. And as always, I hope you have subscribed.